It's 1985. Live Aid is attempting to feed the world, and Back to the Future lands in movie theaters everywhere. But in California, terror is everywhere. In cities, towns, and suburbs across the Golden State are the scene of a slew of vicious, violent crimes that plague ordinary civilians. No one can sleep easy. No one is safe. No matter your age, sex, or race, you could be the next victim of the Night Stalker. But who is the Night Stalker? And how did the world come to understand one of the most notorious and terrifying serial killers of all time? On the chilly morning of February 29th, 1960 in El Paso, Texas, Richard Richie Ramirez is born the youngest of five children to Julian and Mercedes Ramirez. Julian does not have legal status in the US and as such makes very little money at his job working on the railroad. The family is plagued by poverty. Julian often flies into an uncontrollable rage, resulting in his children receiving heavy beatings. As a teenager, Richie spends a lot of time with his cousin Mike, who recently returned from serving in the United States Army Special Forces in the Vietnam War. Mike is predatory though, and violent, entertaining Richie with horrific stories of the war crimes he committed against Vietnamese civilians and soldiers. He shows Richie photographs of people being tortured and mutilated. They spend hours upon hours smoking weed together and discussing satanic worship. You know, the usually family-friendly discussions. One day, Mike's girlfriend loses patience and stands up to Mike. He shoots her dead, then and there, in front of 13-year-old Richie, who's close enough to be hit by the blood spray. Later, cousin Mike is found not guilty of his girlfriend's murder on the basis of insanity, and so resumes his hold over Richie Ramirez. Richie soon withdraws from friends and family and moves in with his older sister and her husband, Roberto. The bad news? Roberto is another twisted influence on Richie. He takes the 13-year-old under his wing as a peeping Tom. But just how far can the effects of this traumatic childhood spread? Ramirez first explores his violent passions at his job as a hotel worker. He steals room keys to rob customers and is fired when caught trying to sexually assault a guest. No charges are brought against him, so his record remains relatively clean with a few misdemeanors. He drops out of high school and, inspired by the Hillside Strangler, moves to California in 1982. But it's only 1982. Ramirez is a long way from the infamy of the Hillside Strangler. No one knows him, but there's a spree of indiscriminate violence on the way that California will never forget. April 10th, 1984, San Francisco. The body of nine-year-old Mei Lung is found hanging from a pipe in the basement of a hotel. There are no suspects, no viable evidence, and no leads. A couple months later, on June 28th, 1984, a 79-year-old woman is found nearly decapitated in her apartment in Glasgow Park, Los Angeles. A single fingerprint is found on a mesh window screen. Both cases would go unsolved. Then, on February 25th, 1985, in Montebello, California, while waiting for her older sister at a bus stop, a six-year-old girl is kidnapped, carried away in a zip bag, and assaulted by an unknown man before being left in Silver Lake, California. March 11, 1985, Monterey, California. In the middle of the night, a nine-year-old boy is stolen from his home, kidnapped, assaulted, and left almost five hours away in a park near Silver Lake, California. Less than a week later, on March 17th, 1985, 20-year-old Maria Hernandez is shot and wounded, and her roommate, Dale Okazaki, is shot dead by an unknown male attacker. Later that day, two miles from Hernandez and Okazaki, 
Sai Lian Yu is dragged from her car and shot. She dies in the hospital the next day. According to detectives, there are no connections between the victims. They all live in different parts of California. They're all different ages, races, and genders. Police have no reason to suspect that any of these crimes are linked. As far as they're concerned, they're looking for multiple killers on the loose. California is still dreaming of innocence. No one really locks their doors at night. Some even leave them slightly open. Can you imagine? Anyone seeking an innocent victim just needs to try a few door handles and see who they find. Then, on March 27, 1985, in Whittier, California, an attacker enters the home of 64-year-old Vincent Zazara and his wife Maxine. Vincent is beaten to death and Maxine is stabbed. After she dies, her body is mutilated. A T-shape is carved into her chest and her eyes are gouged out to be taken from the house inside a jewelry box. Amid the crime scene's horrifying sights and smells, there is a general lack of evidence. Just a shoe print in a flower bed and some ballistics information from the bullets recovered. It isn't a lot to go on, but finally, something clicks. The bullets match up to those found in other attacks in different cities. This isn't the work of many monsters, no. There's a serial killer on the loose in California. But even with this information, it's like trying to catch a shot. Detectives were not prepared for the slew of murders on the horizon. On May 29, 1985, in Monrovia, California, two elderly sisters are beaten almost to the point of death. They're found two days later, both barely alive. Satanic symbols are found at the scene. June 29, 1985, Arcadia, California. 32-year-old Patty Higgins is attacked at her home. Her throat is slashed wide open. She isn't found until July 2nd, when she fails to show up for work and colleagues get suspicious. A few days later, on July 2nd, 1985, just two miles from the Higgins home, Mary Louise Cannon is murdered in her house. Her throat is also cut. Then, five days later, on July 7th, 1985, in Monterey Park, 61-year-old Joyce Nelson is punched and kicked repeatedly to death. An imprint of an Avia sneaker is left on her face. Four days later, on July 11, 1985, again in Monterey Park, the neighbor watch holds a meeting in response to the murders. Over 600 people attend, but there are still no suspects, no solid leads, no hope for Californians. Then on July 20th, 1985, in Glendale, California, things continue to escalate. A couple in their 60s are attacked with a machete before being shot in cold blood. Their bodies are mutilated, and the house is cleared of all valuables. Later that day, in Sun Valley, Chena Rong Kovanan is murdered at his home, and both his wife and son are assaulted and made to swear to Satan. They do not know their attacker, who leaves with over $30,000 worth of cash and jewelry. But a witness sees a man fleeing the house and driving away in a brown Pontiac Grand Prix. August 6th, Northridge, California. Chris Peterson, 38, and his wife Virginia, 27, are both shot in the head by a 25 caliber semi-automatic handgun. Miraculously, both survive, and Chris Peterson manages to avoid being shot two more times before his attacker flees. Two days later, on August 8, 1985, in Diamond Bar, Elias Abuath is shot dead while sleeping. His wife is assaulted and badly beaten, but left alive. Their two small children, one aged three years old and the other three months old, are thankfully left unharmed. That afternoon, police confirm they have found a link between the murders. For the first time, the news breaks publicly across California that a serial killer is at large. 
newspapers and news shows blast the now infamous police sketch of the sadistic killer everywhere, labeling him the Night Stalker. The legend is born. On August 10th of the same year, the LA Police Department reveals that reports of crimes are up by 15%. There is statewide panic. The Night Stalker could strike at any moment, in any town. Unsurprisingly, gun shops have a huge uptake in sales. There's mass panic spreading in California. People are confused and scared. A $10,000 reward is offered for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of the Night Stalker. The shooting of Sai Lian Yu on March 17, 1985 is finally connected to the case thanks to ballistic evidence from the gun used in the crime. But there are still no known suspects, just fragments of evidence left to piece together. Then, on August 17th, in San Francisco, a man breaks into the home of Peter Pan, 66, and his wife, Barbara, 62 at the time. Pan is shot while asleep. His wife is violated before being shot in the head. The crime scene is covered with pentagrams drawn in her lipstick. Five days later, on August 22, 1985, the San Francisco Police Department confirmed that the Night Stalker attacked Peter and Barbara Pan, and their statement says that ballistics information and the satanic messages link this crime to earlier one. Finally, another critical piece of evidence links the crimes, but details are kept secret from the public while the authorities investigate. Families watch the news, gripped by Night Stalker updates, glued to their TVs, terrified he will invade their homes next. One evening, the mayor of San Francisco at the time, Diane Feinstein, appears on the news to discuss the case. She again offers the $10,000 reward, but she goes too far this time. She reveals to the public that the crimes have been linked by a stolen car and a distinctive shoe print present at multiple scenes. Diane, what are you doing? It is immediately apparent that Feinstein has made a mistake. But what she can't know is that that same evening, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, walks onto the Golden Gate Bridge casually and tosses his Aviva sneakers over the edge into the river to never be found. The shoe prints will never connect them to a crime scene again. August 25th, 1985, Orange County, Bill Cairns, 27, is shot in the head while sleeping. His fiance, Inez Erickson, 29, is sexually assaulted by the attacker and left critically injured. Inez is determined not to let her attacker get away. As the Night Stalker escapes the house, Inez drags herself to the window just in time to see an orange 1976 Toyota Corolla station wagon driving away from the scene. Good for you, Inez. This would crack the case open, but not just yet. Now, what's this photo of a smiling teenage boy got to do with the Night Stalker? Well, it's actually some good news. Finally. One night in late August 1985, 13-year-old James Romero hears strange noises coming from outside his house. At first, he thinks it's an animal, but then hears footsteps and realizes someone's lurking out there. James runs to his bedroom and sees a shadowy figure outside. He runs back to check outside in time to see a man running off towards an orange Toyota Corolla station wagon parked in the street. James seizes his chance and writes down the license plate, which he reports to police later on. The police form a composite sketch of the car. James Romero doesn't know it yet, but he's just survived an encounter with the Night Stalker. Soon, James is caught up in the frenzy of trying to catch Ramirez. Police drive him around, desperately looking for the car he saw that night, and his description of the Night Stalker, appearance, gives the police something to go on. But is this enough to catch one of the worst serial killers California has ever seen? Then, 
In Wilshire Center, California, police find the stolen Toyota. There is no evidence in the car except for one lone fingerprint on the back of the rear view mirror. And just like that, they find a map. After months of trying to catch an elusive serial killer, the fingerprint matches 25-year-old Richard Ramirez, whose prints are on record thanks to old misdemeanors. The next day, Richard Ramirez's mugshot, along with the most recent police sketch, are posted all over Californian newspapers. In a press conference, the police declare, We know who you are now. There is no place you can hide. But Ramirez misses the media frenzy. He's too busy in Tucson, Arizona, visiting his brother. It isn't long before he catches on, though. On August 21st, 1985, Ramirez arrives back in L.A. A woman in a convenience store recognizes him and starts screaming, El Maton! El Maton! A Spanish phrase meaning, the killer! The killer! The commotion draws attention to Ramirez, and he takes off running down the street. A growing crowd follow him on foot for more than two miles before they finally catch him. They beat Ramirez within an inch of his life, but police arrive on the scene just in time, rescuing Ramirez from the crowd and arresting him. At that exact moment, they don't realize they've just caught one of America's most prolific serial killers. Justice for the Night Stalker's victims would be slow. The trial doesn't start for another four years after his arrest, and Ramirez finds new ways to continue his reign of terror throughout the trial. He torments the jury and everyone present. One day, he raises his hand to show a pentagram drawn on it, sending the courtroom into a tailspin. At another point in the trial, it is discovered that Ramirez plans to sneak a gun into the courtroom and shoot the prosecutor. Fast forward to September 1989. Finally, Ramirez is convicted of 13 murders, 5 attempted murders, 11 sexual assaults, and 14 burglaries. Ramirez takes the news pretty well and says, No big deal. Death always comes with the territory. I'll see you in Disneyland. When the judge reads out his death sentence, Ramirez grins. In his official response, he states, You maggots make me sick. You don't understand me. You're not expected to. You're not capable of it. I'm beyond your experience. I'm beyond good and evil. In 2009, new technology allows police to match Ramirez's DNA to that found in the case of nine-year-old Mei Leung in the hotel basement. Finally, bringing her case to rest and providing closure for her family. The Night Stalker wouldn't live long enough to meet his end at the hands of the California death penalty. Instead, after decades of substance abuse and malnourishment and 23 years on death row, Richard Ramirez would succumb to blood cancer and liver failure on June 7, 2013 at the Marin Health Medical Center in Kentfield, California. The punishment is not just for his surviving victims, but there is nothing they can do now. Richard Ramirez's name would be etched in the history books as one of the most brutal serial killers of all time. And there you have it, the haunting tale of Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video and want to be first in line for new videos, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out. And please hit the thumbs up button if you like this video and share, share, share. I'll see you real soon in the next one. Thanks for watching.